And we are rolling on February 7th in part two of our extemporaneous questions. We're about to hear from Eric, who's going to address the question, will losing the popular vote delegitimize President Trump's position? And you are standing in the power stance, managing attention. You can take a half step forward, just don't come in front of the brown uh, line. Communicating respect <coughs> non-verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front and the center. Say your name, feel the love, and start your speech. I'm Eric Renslow. Hi, Eric. Hi. So I have a quote. The purpose of the Electoral College is to prevent the tyranny of the majority and to protect minority rights, which is why the spacious campaign is so ironic. Now, who do you think, this, happened, this was a quote after the election, and who do you think said that? Someone from the liberal side or the conservative side? Well, you would think it's the liberal side because they're making fun of the Electoral College, but it's actually a longtime GOP strategist, Mary Madeline. So just to set the record straight, the Electoral College vote was 306 for President Trump and 232 for Hillary Clinton. But the popular vote was 62.9 million for Donald Trump, President Donald Trump and 65.8 million for Hillary Clinton. But I'm going to argue that this should not delegitimize his position. But first I'd like to make an analogy to the Super Bowl. Now you all hopefully watch the Super Bowl or else advertising companies will be angry they spent a million dollars per commercial. But they were, the Patriots were down 28 to 3, and they came back. So we'll get back to that later. But my thesis is losing the popular vote does not delegitimize President Donald Trump's position because under the Electoral College, advertising and campaigning is significantly different. In addition, the attack from many is disingenuous as they are merely looking for any reason to criticize President Donald Trump. This is significant because it speaks to something very important in American politics, which is mandate. If you have mandate as a president, you can get many things passed. And if you don't have mandate, or if the election was not seen as fair, you do not have as much support to get your policies through. But losing a popular vote should not affect President Trump's mandate. So number one is advertising. Now I'm going to reference a lot of Donald, <coughs> President Donald Trump's tweets throughout this speech as sort of evidence of his stance. And if I try to say his voice, it's not trying to offend him, it's just my interpretation of what it sounds like. So, on December 21st, 2016, he says, campaigning to win the Electoral College is much more difficult and sophisticated than the popular vote. Hillary focused on the wrong states. So now we have some statistics from Advertising Age, where it says the amount of money spent on certain states. In Florida, Hillary Clinton spent $18.8 million, and Trump spent ten, President Trump spent $10.4 million. In Pennsylvania, Hillary Clinton spent $8.4 million, and President Trump spent $3.4 million. Ohio, Hillary Clinton, $8 million, President Trump, $4 million. Now, let's see where they didn't spend money. California, Hillary Clinton, $570,000. President Donald Trump, $0. Texas, Hillary Clinton, $35,000. President Donald Trump, $0. New York, Hillary Clinton, $0. President Donald Trump, $0. Now, another tweet on December 21st, I would have done even better in this election if that is possible, he tries to emphasize, if the winning was based on the popular vote, but he would campaign differently. Now, how would he campaign differently? The second point is the large states versus small states. He says, President Donald Trump said in an interview, Maine, I went to Maine four times. I went to Maine because no, everyone was saying you can get to 269, but you can't get to 270. So I went to Maine four times. Think of how small Maine is. Like, that's the country I bet most of us don't even know the capital of. He went four times. He didn't even go to California. And we're much bigger than Maine. I don't need to cite a source for that. That's common knowledge. Um, he also <laughs> says that if on November 15, 2016, if the election were based on total popular vote, I would have campaigned in New York, Florida, and California in Texas and want even bigger, he didn't say big league, but big, big league, and more easily. Number three is that a lot of his attacks are disingenuous. One of his tweets says, the Dems, when they incorrectly thought they were going to win, asked that the election night tabulation be accepted. Not so anymore on November 26th. And 
A never Trump member, Rory Cooper, before the election says, everyone needs to stop being surprised that the Trump campaign lacks any sense of strategy, competent staff, or a game plan to succeed. This was when he was in Alabama, if you remember. This was when he, was, he took some stops in non-swing states. He was routinely criticized. He later goes on to compare President Trump's strategic acumen to a piece of burnt toast. So you see, no matter what he would have done, he still would have been criticized. And it's just opening, it, it's a very disingenuous attack. So to summarize, there are significant differences in advertising and campaigning, campaigning when trying to win the Electoral College. Let's take, for example, the Super Bowl. There is a difference between a national ad, like did you, do you all remember the Audi commercial when they had that little girl that says, oh, the dad says, am I supposed to tell her that she's less important than her brother and her blah, blah, blah. That's a national ad. But if it was a local ad like that was in the Electoral College, it would have been much more specific advertising. And as you can imagine, when President Donald Trump started out this election, he was very far behind. I don't know if it was 28 to 3 very far behind, but it was very far behind. So clearly something his campaigning was doing put him over the top. And you have to give credit that if he were to adopt a national strategy, he may have, in fact, won the national popular vote. You can't speculate from these results because it just, he spends zero dollars in California. There's so many people here. He spends zero dollars in New York. It's just a different game. So there's a quote from a JSTOR article right after the Bush presidency. He says, to borrow an analogy, our United candidate deserves the presidency because he won the popular vote plurality is akin to arguing that a team really won a football game when it gained when it got the most total yards but somehow failed to score so when you go back to the past game should we blame them that they got less rushing yards should we blame them that they didn't get as many field goals at the end of the day they got the most points and actually they won by six points just like donald trump won the electoral vote by a, a relatively large margin so in conclusion, losing the popular vote does not delegitimize President Trump's position. And to go back to my first quote, she tries to criticize President Trump by saying that the purpose of the Electoral College is to protect minority rights, which is ironic, but I would argue that the reaction to the results of the majority to the minority is the most ironic part of the campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you, you, you volunteer to critique. I thought this was what we were supposed to do. I thought I was volunteering to say what's good. The first, the first what's person good? says it's good, the second person says it's wrong. Go so for it. Go for it. Say what you like. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Quinn. Um, one hi, thing I Quinn. One thing I really liked about your speech is you interwove facts and quotes really well. So it created kind of a very um, powerful argument, one that was pretty hard to disagree with at least. Prove it. Arthur, my name is Arthur. Hi, Arthur. Uh, so my advice is just to walk a little bit more and more confidently, but overall I like your humor and uh, a bit of sarcasm maybe. That you was know, really good. Uh, your argument was very, you know, very convincing. To say the least. Yeah. So, good job. What was the time? Great. Eric, uh, your speech was interesting. I um, think the Mary Matlin quote, I think you're taking her quote a little out of context um, because uh, when she said it, it's designed to prevent the tyranny of the majority, it's meant the majority of states and to protect the minority uh, states. <laughs> And which is why, and the word is specious, and she's referring to the people that are talking about uh, it being specious that he won the Electoral College and he doesn't have legitimacy. And she's saying uh, that is specious uh, because he is a legitimate president. That's the way it's done, and that's the way it always has been done. Um, Eric, I was looking for a better understanding of you of the Electoral College and how it works and why it came into existence from, uh, if you read the Federalist Papers or some classes in poli-sci, tell us a little bit more about it, that would be fine. Um, 
on your thesis, uh, I didn't, I got your thesis that it doesn't delegitimize President Trump's uh, position. What I didn't get is a strong three-point preview of the three reasons in, in the top and the beginning, which I needed to have. The significance statement, uh, yes, it was good, was right on track. That's why we were talking about a mandate, because mm, you don't have a mandate, you don't have anything. Um, on your main body, uh, you labeled it as national TV ads versus local market ads. And I was trying to relate that to how that related to his <laughs> legitimacy. And I didn't get the real link between well, that and how. Well, part of the, the main argument was that if it was a national popular vote, Hillary Clinton would have won the election. Have done so I'm other saying things. that it would have just been totally different. He would have done and other would, things. He, he so. may have, in fact, won the popular vote. He could have done other things and won the popular yeah, vote if that, that was, was the main. If that was what he was after. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then your second argument. You want to return to, and that's you want to return to, and therefore that's why his mandate is not going to be diminished or, or something. Return to your thesis at this end of the segment, which you didn't do. Uh, campaign in larger versus smaller states. I saw that as essentially a similar thing to your um, first point, but uh, I like the quote about Maine and 269 to 270. Um, campaign and brings the smaller states into play, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. That They have to go everywhere and go to the small state, otherwise they just go to the coast and deal with the limousine liberals, um, you know, and uh, we'd have, what a country that would be, hmm, yeah. Um, and so, but again, I needed to have you return to your thesis at the end of your second point. Uh, you didn't walk. Yeah. three times, and you were reading too much. Uh, as far as a disingenuous, I didn't get the link to, it's a, okay, I agree it's disingenuous for them to say it, but link that back to why that's going to increase or decrease his mandate. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, summary was fine, conclusion was fine, and you went to the irony of Mary Matlin's quote, which I don't agree you quoted her correctly. Needed to hear your quotes uh, more with the dates and the, that you, you presented. Other than that, good job. Thank you. Okay, next. No time. What time is it? No time, come on, we got, we got time for one more. You really want to go today? Professor, can we see the XM sheet for taking out your topic? Yeah, I asked earlier if you needed to get it. No one spoke up. Yeah, I just went. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay, go forward. Get up there. Yeah. I it. I take it out. Stamp, 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 stamp. Who asked for it? I did. Okay, I, I, Quinn, you'll personally hand it back to me. Of course I will. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. So, there's like a mini one in, in depth. <coughs> Lydia stands before us managing attention, communicating respect non-verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front and the center. Step over that way a little bit. <coughs> Say your name, feel the love. 
start your speech. Hi, my name is Vidya. Hi, Vidya. So, imagine you're a manufacturer in the year 2050, right? You, you have a great business, you run an efficient company, and that's how you put food on the table. But then, because of domestic market changes, you decide to export instead, because suddenly there isn't demand at home. So, what do you do? You want to export to businesses, say, in Asia. You want to export to Vietnam, Indonesia, maybe India, but you can't. You find yourself shut out of all the markets that you want to expose, uh, uh, that you want to export to. Why? Because those countries have free trade agreements with each other. Because the US did not sign the TPP now and has actually like backed out from it, you no longer have the option of exporting to those countries. So <clears throat> this is the future that awaits most of American manufacturing workers from this point forward. It, with the, for the question, should the U.S. have signed the TPP, my thesis is that the U.S. should have signed it because uh, that would give it access to like foreign markets within Asia. And why, why does this matter? Right? It's just a free trade agreement. It shouldn't matter like on a moral level or whatever. But it does because Asia is increasingly important on like a political and an economic basis. But also, if the U.S. doesn't like engage through trade with countries on the other side of the world, it might find itself isolate, isolated in the economic sphere. For example, the McKinsey Global Institute researched and found that the center of gravity economically is moving towards Asia at a rate faster than ever before in human history. So if the U.S. doesn't get on the bandwagon now, it might find itself shut out. How am I going to prove to you that the U.S. should have signed, signed the TPP? To three big reasons, right? First, I'm going to show to you that signing the TPP would have led to like a, good, a, a benefit to the U.S. in terms of power and policy. Second, it would have benefited the U.S. in terms of like the American consumers. And third, most importantly, it would have benefited producers and exporters here in the U.S. First, in terms of power and policy, right? Why would this have been a good thing? Because for the longest time, the U.S. Has, has championed like human rights and labor laws. But in this situation, it's not able to anymore. Why? Because now that you haven't signed the TPP, you can't bring in those Asian countries into the umbrella where you could have influenced how they assign like labor laws and such. That it, you could have influenced, the U.S. could have influenced China by trading with most of its trading partners, right? So you could have actually shut China out of that market or influenced it to better its own labor laws. You can't do that anymore because the U.S. hasn't signed. <clears throat> Second, it would have affected the power that the U.S. can exert on Asian countries. For example, David Otter, who's like the assistant head of economics at MIT, said that it would actually have allowed the U.S. to, to uh, settle agreements out of the WTO that gets stalled. So the U.S. could have exerted like a bigger power on the Asian field and could have pushed back on Chinese hegemony. Second, it would have benefited American consumers. How is that, right? Because American consumers could have access to cheap goods. Like all good trade agreements, this would have given you access to like cheaper goods, safer goods, and better regulatory standards. Um, how would this affect our producers? And this is the most important thing, because one of the most important criticisms of the TPP was that it would be <coughs> producing jobs or manufacturing jobs abroad. But here's the problem with that criticism, right? First, those jobs weren't coming back anyway. There's nothing, like a, a lot of these countries that are in the TPP, like Asia, like sorry, Singapore, Malaysia, etc. the U.S. already has bilateral ties with. So those people already have access to U.S. markets, so you're not getting those jobs back. But more importantly, if we had signed the TPP, we would have like brought them into the appropriate laws, uh, brought them into like the regulatory mechanism that the U.S. currently imposes. Second, imagine like even if the jobs need to get shipped abroad, right? The workers need to be retrained right now, rather than 50 years later when like technology would have advanced far more, and people aren't going to be in a position where they can get retrained that easily anymore. So third, you could also have maintained artificial conditions within the U.S. so that people could keep their jobs, but that would also not have been a good thing because it wouldn't have been a sustainable mechanism to keep jobs here. The Peterson Institute of International Economics also said that if we had signed the TPP, the annual real income within the United States aggregate would have increased by $131 billion over the next few years. This was, in like, this was the estimate they had in 2016. Other institutions, like sorry, other sectors like services and agriculture would have benefited enormously because that's where U.S. has a competitive advantage because that's where U.S. has an advantage in terms of technology. But most importantly, right? Think about those industries right now that are suffering the most, like poultry or farming or like car exports. These are industries that, if we had signed the TPP, would not just like be saved, but they would actually thrive. Why? Because currently they're having, they have like tariffs and taxes of like 35 to 70 percent, 
which is why we're not competitive on a global scale. If we had signed the TPP, all of those tariffs would have reduced, which meant that exporters now had access to a market that could be increased by like 50 to 70 percent. The Peterson Institute also said that because like um, intellectual property rights uh, were better enforced under the TPP, institutions like media companies and technology companies would suddenly be in a position to do much better than they're doing right now. So, in conclusion, what have I shown you? I've shown you that signing the TPP would have actually been better in terms of like US power, in terms of foreign policy, because we could have pr promoted human rights on a global scale, but also because we could have increased the power that we exert over countries all around the world, not just like in our immediate region. Second, it would have benefited the American consumers, the everyday people who just want to buy things a little cheaper while maintaining the same level of safety and like uh, the goods of the certain standard. And third, it would have been amazing for producers, not just because you know that you'd have like a more efficient economy, but because industries that right now are suffering, like poultry, like agriculture, like soybeans, would have actually gotten the boost that it needed to become competitive in the global markets. David Dorn, who's a professor at the University of Zurich, said this, blocking the TPP because of justified happiness over like manufacturing's lost glory is the same as refighting the last trade war. Specifically, he said that it would amount to beggaring the future in retribution for the past that they've lost. Right? So think again about Ameri that American worker in 2050 who's struggling to cope with the economy. We should have thought of him before we backed out of the TPP. Thank you. Thank you. Better roadmap of where you're going. Also, better dates. Give us the dates. You had great sources, great economic sources, but better dates. But a really fine job, <laughs> video. We're out of time. Thank you. Because I think that I, I picked the one about what's the filibuster that's going on right now. I probably shouldn't pick that one, right? Well, who picked that by folder for stamp one? Yeah. Did we get to see our? Never. I'll post them. Oh, was I supposed to give it out? Okay, I'll email it today. In fact, you come with me to my office, I'll email it. Yeah. If we haven't gone yet, we're going to go next week. It's okay. And next week. Okay. And uh, also, yeah. another question? Yeah. By the end of the quarter, we're about to give two extent speeches? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs>